Which brings me to the topic of our first half of our session today. And uh, gee, that, that group is the no-use group. I'm going to keep that aside. The, the topic of the session today is um, it's really uh, regarding our relationship with God. And the subject, which I'm only going to partially cover for the first session, and then the second session after the break, we're going to do some question and answers. So that, because I've just noticed that we haven't done any question and answers as a group here in Butterham for quite a few months. So, but uh, I want to cover this topic firstly, and that is um, positively accepting God's gifts. Um, I could have called it passionately <laughs> accepting God's gifts, but uh, either will do. For the majority of us, we don't know when we're giving, being given a gift from God. And so what we finish up doing is we finish up rejecting the gift immediately without even knowing that what just passed by through our life was a potential gift that if we embraced, it would become something that would all, almost change our life. And so often we get these constant gifts. And if, if you just imagine for a moment that you were God, does that sound too sacrilegious for you? Or <laughs> Just imagine you're up there and you've got all of these children all there that you're wanting to have a personal relationship with. Right? So you've got all these children, most of whom are quite rebellious. <laughs> right? So most of them, are, you know, they want to go off and do their own thing. They don't want to listen to you. They don't want to take notice of you. They want to just live their own life. They even are rebellious against the laws you've created. Right? And they're so rebellious that even when a person comes to talk to them that's one of your helpers, you know, one of the people that have connected with you, you being God in this example, and, and you're giving out information and, and to these people that are helping and they're trying to give help to the ones that are rebellious, but no, no one's going to listen. And then you've created a whole set of laws and one of those big, big laws is the law of attraction which actually demonstrate to the person through the process of pain or pleasure, demonstrates to the person that they are actually out of harmony with love or in harmony with love. And, uh, and yet hardly any people listen to that law either. In other words, they go through their life creating a lot of pain and then they want to yell and scream at God about the fact that they've got pain. Or they want to yell and scream at their mate, their, you know, their partner about the pain or they want to yell and scream a bit to their parents about the pain or whatever but they don't want to deal with the issue of responsibility for the pain and then on top of that you've created some other laws like the law of cause and effect in other words this idea that uh, that and and it is a law that that if you don't deal with the cause of something you will continue to get the effect the rest of your life right so you've created that law but nobody listens to that law either. They keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Right? And nobody's listening to that law either. So there you are, your God, sitting in this place where you can see all of this happening and feel these interactions going on for all of your children. What would you do? What would you do? Because if you love them, you'd want to do something, wouldn't you? So what... <laughs> That's a cop out, that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, what, what God does is gives you gifts. He gives you the opportunity of taking gifts from God constantly. And a lot of these gifts are, are little bits of information offered to you from others, even. Information offered to you by your environment, if we could call it that way. 
that you have the choice of accepting or rejecting. And for the majority of us, we finish up rejecting most of them. And the reason why we reject most of them is because we have a whole set of emotions. And these emotions began way, way back, right back at the beginning of human civilization on this planet. And those emotions began with the emotion of self determination. The emotion of being addicted to your own free will. So what you call, I'll, I'll put it in brackets, <coughs> free will, because it's not real free will that we're addicted to, it's something else. And the emotion that the only person that matters in my life is me. So what would you call that emotion? Self-ishness or self being self-absorbed. So the first human couple, um, when they decided that they wanted to walk away, so Ammon and a man I'm talking about, the first human couple, when they decided they wanted to walk away from God, the decision wasn't so much to walk away from God, the decision was more a decision, I want to determine everything in my personal life. I want to be the person who has control of everything. And in fact, they even went further than that. They even went down into this emotion that, I want to become God in my own right. And in fact, when you look at a lot of the New Age beliefs today, that we are all gods is one of them, it actually comes from this very first emotional error that was created way, way, way back when they made these choices and decisions. God had given them a huge amount of gifts. God had actually prepared at this point in time a perfect planet with a wide variety abund of abundant wildlife, bird life, animal, uh, animal uh, fish life, all kind of life and on top of that uh, an abundance of support in terms of what they were to eat, what they could drink, wear and so forth if they wanted to. And God provided all of these things right at the beginning, all these gifts. But that gift, those gifts weren't enough for, these, for, the for the decision to be made that I wanted to be self-determinant. And so what they decided to do was instead of being God-reliant, they decided to become self-reliant. And in that one decision, much of humanity's current pain still rests. So much of our current pain is that we want to be self-reliant. And as I've said in many other presentations, the emotion of self-reliance is perhaps the most insidious, damaging and most difficult emotion for you to eradicate as an emotional injury inside of yourself. It causes all sorts of problems. But one of the biggest problems it causes is it causes us to reject gifts it causes us to actually not display a spirit of gratitude and accept gifts that are offered to us. It causes us to reject the gifts and push them away from us. Because many times gifts come in the form of suggestion. Do, do you understand what I mean by that? A little child makes a suggestion to you. <laughs> and there's one of God's gifts, God's gifts being given to you. The potential for you to take up the opportunity to accept the gift is dependent upon your humility and your ability to hear and your ability to feel. And yet most of us in that state, we go, oh, don't be stupid, you know, we've got to do it this way, this is the way the world currently is, so you know, you, you'll learn that when you grow up. You know? and, and off we go doing it our own way as we normally do. And we just rejected another gift. We are constantly rejecting God's gifts most of which come through interactions with people that God can connect to at the time. And God can actually provide, through their thoughts, a feeling that they can then express to you and then you can either take it or leave it. And the majority of us, because of our emotion of self-reliance, 
leave it. The majority of us push all of God's gifts away. And the problem with doing that is, obviously, we just get another gift offered, you know, another gift, another suggestion, and we push that away. Now, how can God direct us when God can't connect to us personally? God can't, God's, the spirits that are connected to God can't connect to us personally. And on top of that, we are rejecting all the other gifts that God could offer. Like, how hard is it now for God to give us any direction at all? Very, very difficult, isn't it? We're, and all of it is because we're using our free will in a manner that is actually out of harmony with even the love of ourselves. Because the truth is that every gift that God offers us that we could have the opportunity to take up can be complete. Every one of them is in harmony with God's will and with God's desires and with God's love. And our rejection of it through our desire to hold on to, passionately hold on to our so-called free will, often is it a rejection of an opportunity just to love ourselves in that moment. And that's what we do to ourselves. We reject things, thinking we're rejecting them for another purpose or another reason, and in really all we're doing is rejecting them because we don't love ourselves enough to recognise that that was a, just a gift that was offered to us just then that just went past so with our decisions we have choices constantly and these choices constantly decide the rest of our future you'll be surprised how often one single choice can lead to your own degradation and destruction just one single choice historically these things have happened over and over again if you talk to many of the celestial spirits in the spirit world who have had terrible lives on earth, had terrible lives working their way through things in the hells of the spirit world before they become a celestial spirit, they will always look back and most of the time they will look back on a series of choices that they thought at the time were quite minor and yet their own degradation of their own soul happened through those choices. And some became passionately involved in their own self-importance so much that their choices became evil in nature and if you talk to one of my friends in the spirit world Nero who was in the first century when he when he was living on earth he spent literally thousands of years in hell in places that you would find unimaginable in terms of the amount of pain he received as a result of the decisions that he made out of harmony with love when he was on the earth a life on earth lived passionately in the wrong direction causes huge amounts of pain in the spirit world huge amounts of pain and many of the spirits i was talking about yesterday who are those spirits who are still wanting to dominate the earth and dominate the world those spirits have lived a life when they're on earth passionately in an evil direction and what the pain they're in they still hasn't stopped yet. They still haven't degraded enough yet to feel their own pain and, uh, and to actually notice the intensity of it. And once they do, the intensity of the pain is immense. The alternative is that we can positively accept God's gifts. So instead of negatively choosing some things, we can go on the positive direction. Just like the negative direction is intensely painful... The positive direction is intensely pleasurable. Right? That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of what God's created. And you'll be surprised how even one little decision that is in a positive direction is rewarded by God in the spirit world when you pass. Here it's not rewarded very much at all. In fact, many positive things we do go completely unnoticed here on earth and this is one reason why we become quite disillusioned here on earth because we feel that people are not noticing the good things we've done but God notices everything he, her children do, do. Right? and so there, there is a reward attached to every single positive action that we've ever taken our entire life that's been harmonious with truth or love and the more positive actions you take in your life the greater the rewards right? And if the, the desire to do those positive actions isn't for the reward, the reward's are greater again. <laughs> That's how God's created her system. 
And so we can choose to accept God's gifts in a positive direction and actually find that our happiness and our life improves so rapidly, actually. And this can occur even on earth. Right? The problem, of course, with the earth environment, as we talked about yesterday, so here we are on the earth, and surrounding the earth is this cloud, if you like, of energy or emotion. The cloud of emotion are those primary emotions we listed yesterday. The emotions of doubts, fear, rage, shame. All of those emotions are surrounding the earth. So if you're here sitting on the, in Australia, and I suppose we're, we're on top of the world here, aren't we, at the moment? No. <laughs> so, um, so we're sitting up there in Australia, and, uh, and, and what's coming around us is all of this emotion from our environment is affecting us individually but while that's happening God is offering us potential actions constantly he's offering us gifts every single moment in fact the law of attraction itself is one of God's gifts if you think about it now I've heard many of you complaining about the law of attraction and your own law of attraction many of you feel despondent about it and feel quite negative about it can you see that in that space, you're, you're not acknowledging that it's actually a gift? It's a gift, it's a feedback system God's given you. It's a gift that God's given you, that law. But not only that, here we are sitting in Australia and we're getting lots of opportunities. At the moment, Australia is getting a lot more opportunities than many other countries, if you think about it from the divine love perspective. right? There's a lot of things happening here in Australia about, the divine, about, about divine truth. But many of us, uh, because of our day-to-day -day lives and because mo more often because of our emotions, pre predominantly the emotions that began right back at the beginning as a part of the human transmission of disease, if you like, and if we call disease, disease, or a, a, a painful emotion that creates disease, then you can see that actually all of our painful life and our pains in our life are really created by a whole group of emotions that began literally millennia ago, being transmitted from generation to generation. And, and each subsequent generation keeps rejecting the gifts that God is giving them. So all of these different laws, but also individual gifts that God's giving you. The situations, and this is something that I'd like to make as the primary point, the situations that come up in your day-to-day -day life where you have the choice to be truthful or loving or not are the primary gifts that God gives you in your development. Do you, do you understand what I've just said? The situations right, that God gives you where you have a choice to be truthful and loving or to be untruthful, fear-based or unloving those particular situations are the primary gifts that God gives you. Every single situation that you interact with another person, another being, another animal, an animal on this earth, or any other thing on this earth, is a situation where you have an opportunity, you're give, being given an opportunity, an opportunity from God. You got, the opportunity is... Do you, do you want to act lovingly and truthfully or do you want to act unlovingly and in fear and with, with untruth? That's the opportunity. Every, now you think of it. How many opportunities did you get last week in, the, in that regard? If you analyse your life carefully, you'll find actually in any one week you normally get thousands of these opportunities right? to act lovingly or unlovingly. In any one week, in any one day, hundreds of them generally come to you. Even if you're home alone, actually, <laughs> right? many of these opportunities come to you. And what we choose to do with the opportunity is going to firstly be a reflection of our soul condition, but it will also create our future condition. Do, do you understand what I mean by that? So, so if I decide to act in an unloving way right at the moment with an interaction that's being projected at me, a gift that God's giving me, then in that particular moment, my choice was made because of my current condition. 
Does that make sense to everyone? So my current condition determines the decision I make right then and there. But it doesn't only determine that. The, the decision that I make creates my future condition. Right? Now, can you see that if I positively accept one of God's gifts and what I do is I look at every situation as an opportunity to be loving or an opportunity to be the opposite to that and then I decide to take the opportunity of being loving right? and it's just a decision in many cases that we need to make. I, take to, 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 I decided to be loving. Now my future condition will improve automatically because of that decision. Right? But if I have the same opportunity offered to me and I decide to be unloving, my future condition is going to degrade. It's, it sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? But it's amazing how many times we don't think of this in our day-to-day -day life. And do you know why we don't think of it? Because we are so passionately self-absorbed in our own emotional state that we don't even want to notice when we're being loving or unloving. Right? If we go up the back, with the, if we go for a microphone up the back, who's got the mics? Yeah, here we go. It's all right. It's all right, we've got one there. Hi, AJ. G'day. Um, could you give... Um, I'm really confused about the word being loving um, mm -hmm. because in my family where I've grown up, being loving means to completely sacrifice every one of my own desires and if you want me to listen to you, well then to be loving, I have to listen to you. I'm really confused. Okay. Firstly, when I talk about being loving, I'm talking about being loving from God's perspective, not from your family's perspective. Does that make sense? Your family certainly is going to have very warped ideas about what love is. And the pain in their life is a reflection of how warped the idea is. Does that make sense? So if, in a, if an act of love, if the desire to feel to, to do lo a loving thing for another causes pain within yourself, there's only two possible reasons why that would be the case. One is that you're out of harmony with divine love, or the second one is that you're actually in harmony with divine love, but your environment is out of harmony with divine love. All right. Do you understand the difference between those two? So, so when I'm acting out of harmony. When I've, when I've got a choice, I can, choo I can choose two different things, to be loving or unloving. That's my choice. But from God's perspective, not from anyone else's perspective. Because there are times, actually, in your life where you'll do the loving thing from God's perspective, but everyone else around you is going to think that was the most unloving thing you could have done. Right? So that's also true. Because you think of how many projections there are at God right at this moment even from yourself, about whether he's being loving or not. Like we're, We often say, God, please help me to do something, and then we don't feel any of God's help. Now, is God capable of helping? Yes. Does God want to help? Yes, but in harmony with her principles of love, right? So God wants to help in harmony with the principles of love and God is capable of helping. If God's capable of creating this body of yours and the universe around you that you live in, then God's surely capable of helping you through a little situation, right? Is that not true? Okay, so if God's capable of helping and we're asking God to help and we don't feel like we're getting any help, then what's that telling us? That God cannot help us in that situation without breaking one of God's laws. That's what it's telling us. Now, when we have the feeling of pain, there can only be two reasons why we have a feeling of pain. Right? And the feeling of pain can only come from two sources, if you think about it. One is a, an error within ourselves. The second source is an error in the environment, which I'll shorten to E and V for everyone, the error in the environment that triggers an error in myself.
But either way, I've got something to deal with when you look at it, don't I? So if I'm in a family situation and my family is making demands of me that I feel if I went ahead and did them, I would feel pain. Then of course, if I go ahead and do them, I am actually not in harmony with myself. Is that not the case? But that doesn't mean that I'm in harmony with God because often we ourselves are out of harmony with God. And the whole reason why we don't want to do something is because we don't want to bring ourselves into harmony with God in many cases. So we need to come to understand that every time when there's a pain in, the, in an interaction, I myself must be out of harmony somewhere. Either I'm out of harmony within myself or I'm out of harmony with what's getting triggered by my environment. There's an error in my environment that's triggering something out of harmony within myself. But either way, I've got to deal with something myself so in the situation you're asking about which is your family how do i determine how do i determine what love is well how you determine what love is is if you're feeling pain at anything then there's something unloving going on inside of yourself inside of yourself so many people say you know like they fall in love and it's such a painful experience many of many of you don't want to have a relationship now because your previous relationships have been painful experiences, right? So, so, so the fact that they've been a painful experience means that you were out of harmony with love. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying that your partner was not because <laughs> the most likely thing is that they were also out of harmony with love, right? But the truth is that if I feel pain, I must have been out of harmony with love. And what I need to do is I need to look at this area of pain and suffering and actually examine it closely every time I feel it. That's how I tell whether I'm doing something loving or not. You will always feel no pain when you're truly in harmony with love. Right? And no one around you will feel real pain when they're truly in harmony with love. When you're, and, and when you're truly in harmony and love, no one around you will feel real pain from what you do, even. So w when your parents say to you, um, you caused me a lot of pain, right? Well, th that statement in itself isn't really harmonious with truth either. Because we can't cause another people, person pain. Even if we actually bop them in the nose, we can't really cause another person pain. Because it's a, they have to actually experience it themselves, inside of themselves, before they'll feel the pain itself. And there's a time in your future where somebody will be able to bop, maybe want to bop you in the nose and you won't feel much pain from it as a result because you've dealt with all of your fears about love and you've dealt with all of the other things about, uh, about your fears of pain and so forth and you'll actually feel quite in a painless state, if you like with regard to any of those negative events that can occur. So, so getting back to the, the question, how we, how we determine whether it's God, God's love or not is how much pain we're in. And if we're in pain, there's something inside of ourselves that is out of harmony with God's love. So if we're in fear, there's something, outside, there's something in disharmony with God's love. If we're in doubt, we're in anger or rage or we're in any of those emotions, there's something inside of me out of harmony with God's love. Now, I'm not saying that the environment isn't too. What I'm saying is you can only control what you do, not what the environment does. So when, you, when I say being loving, to be frank with you, the majority of us know what love would do in most situations. We do. So sometimes, um, like since the talk yesterday, we've been sharing um, quite a lot of our shameful events, which right. has been really beautiful. Awesome. Um, but then there was an example um, this morning on the way in where I was quite in my own stuff and um, I was giving someone a lift in and she was talking about something that was really, really meaningful to herself and I... I didn't feel like listening because I was quite in my own stuff but then I wanted to encourage her to keep on talking because it was quite brave was what she was saying. Mm -hmm. So then I'm in this 
Okay, loving to you, loving to me, what... Um, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, firstly, it's loving for you to honour yourself with your own stuff and to actually be in your own stuff. It's not loving for somebody to actually decide to talk to you in that space. So if I come along, if I come along and I see you in a space of dealing with something emotionally and I then want you to listen to my emotions, I am automatically at that point being unloving towards you. So we've got to ask the question, why do we want to keep having other people listen to our stories? Right? And a lot of the time it's because we're not willing to listen to our own stories and feel about them. We want somebody to share in it with us. So be sensitive. But like, There's been many times I've noticed when Mary's been crying at a group, and particularly early stages, one time I remember she was out the back of the group crying and some, somebody walked up to her and sat down with her and started talking to her and said, oh, I know you're in an emotion, but... And away she went with her own stuff. Right? And many of you do this with me even on a, a, at the breaks. You come up to me and you say, I know you're tired, but... What's that? I'd prefer you say I, that you don't know that I'm tired. Because <laughs> if you know I'm tired, but you're actually making a choice to be unloving. Does that make sense? Can you see that? If you know somebody else is tired, but you're going to keep pestering them, you know that you're being unloving. Most of the time we do know we're being unloving. Now, in the situation you gave, and, and is the other person here and you who, who's, okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's a loaded question in a way, isn't it? Um, so, so what? But I would suggest is to look at the emotion of why you needed to have somebody hear your stuff when you know they're in stuff. Does that make sense? Look at the emotion of why you need them to hear you. Why? Why you need to stay in? Like do that because that is an unloving projection at somebody else. And to be frank with you, most of the time we know when it's unloving. You in that situation, the reason why you asked the question was because you knew there was something wrong here. You weren't being allowed to feel your own emotion completely. And you were getting hooked into her th through an addiction. And the addiction is to please somebody else so that they think nicely of you. Right? Yeah, I realise that I stay open um, and people feel comfortable to talk to me. Yeah. Um, but actually, I really want to blame them for me not allowing me to be in my own emotions. Spot on. So all I would have said myself is, I'm sorry, but I'm in something at the moment and you'll need to just think about that rather than talk about it if you want to drive with me in my car. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And if they still want to talk about it, I'd stop and let them out. <laughs> That's the most loving thing I could do to myself and to them, really. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. So, so a lot of times, you see, we're, we're afraid of acting in the most loving and truthful way, right? And the reason why we're afraid of it is because we have our own addictions in play. And our own addictions often do prevent us from acting lovingly a lot. But to get down to it, if the same thing was done to you, did it feel loving or unloving? That's the question you need to ask yourself. See, most of the time, we are willing to completely overlook in ourselves something that we are definitely going to be critical of in somebody else. Right? So, I'm a, so we might be willing to overlook, oh, you know, we overlook that particular event where, oh, we, here's, an, here's an example that often happens in a partnership. The male projects sexually at another per, uh, person walking along the road and the, and the woman says to him, oh, you just, you know, looked at her and he says, yeah, that's what men do, right? right? So he just overlooked what he did in himself. Now, when the woman's walking along the road with him and she does the same with another man, how does that same man react often? Angry, upset, you know, you're a slut and off he goes. Right? He's just overlooked in himself something that he condemns in another. And we do this quite frequently in our lives. So oftentimes we do know what love, the loving thing to do is, but we overlook it quite rapidly because of our addictions. So every time you felt a bit of pain having to hear somebody else's story, right? So acknowledge the pain. Actually, I don't, and say the truth. 
I don't want to hear your story. Right? Not now. I'm going through my own stuff. But the question also has to be asked, why didn't she notice you're going through your own stuff? And why did she feel like her emotions were more important than yours? That's an unloving thing too. Right? And many times we do these things. Can you see? Many times we have this choice. Many times in our break, you make the choice. In the break, when you go out to get the food, many of you have a bit of a hankering for some of the special things that people have made and you really like that particular thing. And some of you have a, have a make the choice to be the first one to get it. You know that. Right? And then you all crowd around the table and you make the choice to block the people that are serving you from even being able to serve you properly. Does that make sense? That's a choice. Another choice just being made there. Right? And then when we finish up in the evening, we decide to go home and let other people clean up after us. That's another choice we just made there. Can you see, like, in, in a single day we make so many choices and we often don't even know how unloving we're being. Right? And what we need to do is start seeing that every one of these things are basically a decision inside of us that we can choose to, to make. It's the choice to be loving or the choice to be unloving. The choice to be self-absorbed and self-reliant or the choice to actually be God-reliant and feel the rest of the planet and what the rest of the planet's doing. And I'm not saying that you have to act upon it. I'm not saying that you have to listen to everyone's projection here and then do whatever they want because much of what you want is unloving. <laughs> but you need to be sensitive to what is going on in your environment and feel what's happening many of you I'm like many of you come up to ask me a question just at the time I'm about to start speaking and in that moment you're not aware of the choice you just made you made a choice to get some personal satisfaction and prevent 200 people from getting some now 200 people have to wait a minute, two minutes, five minutes for me to talk to you before they... And they've all given their time and that choice is not noticed in that moment. Can you see that? In, even in terms of time, you've just, waited two, you've just wasted 200 people times five minutes just because you were self-absorbed rather than thinking about the rest. Does that make sense? In that moment... That there's these constant things that go on in any particular day where we're just so focused on ourselves and we're so focused on being self-reliant that we don't notice the gift that God has given us, this opportunity. God's given us an opportunity right here. Okay, yep, okay. my opportunity is to give the gift of my love to this group by not engaging AJ in the two, you know, beyond the time that he said he was going to start. That's a gift you can give to the group. Does that make sense? And this is why I say to many of you, no, I cannot, and I actually say it like this, no, <laughs> I cannot speak right now, right? Because I'm very aware of what's happening. And when I go like that, it's a good thing for you to have a think about. <laughs> because usually it means that someone's being unloving, right? Because, it, and this is the thing, is that often we are making these choices, moment by moment by moment by moment, we're making these choices in our lives, not realising that we're making a choice to not love. And every choice we make to not love not only reflects our soul condition, but it has a result on our soul condition. Does that make sense to everyone? It not only demonstrates our current condition, but it also creates our future condition. It degrades our future condition, in fact. So can you see on any one day, this is what our life might be like in terms of our progression towards God. So if we drew a graph, none of you really liked graphs at school, I suppose, did you? How many of you liked them? Just a few of the mathematicians among us, yeah. Okay, so here's a graph. Let's say this is, this is time and this is our lovingness. And therefore, our progression towards God. And this is our unlovingness. 
Or you could think of it as our degradation in our soul condition about love. So in an average day, this is what might happen to us. We get up in the morning, right? And we yell at the kids to get out of bed. Right? So there we go, down into unlovingness. Right? And then we make them dinner. Or, or sorry, we make them breakfast. Then we go back up into, unlovi- into lovingness. And then we get ourselves off to work or whatever. And at work, and, and we're driving to work, and somebody cuts us off and we swear at them. So there it goes down our unlovingness. And then what happens if we get to work and somebody's taken our car park? Right? And so down goes our unlovingness a bit more, right? <laughs> and maybe a bit more. And then, and then we, we go inside and we want to find out who that person was, right? <laughs> so there's a bit more. And then, and then we find out who it was and they, they're crying. And oh, we just feel compassion for them now. So our, our lovingness goes back up again, right? And it may even go back up where, where we started from. And then we start, you know, we have a break and we decide to read the pageant messages for a while or whatever. It goes up a bit. <laughs> And then, and then straight after the break, somebody comes up to us and, uh, and, and tells us that we've got to do a job we don't like. And we decide to do it. So there goes down our unlovingness again. And can you see what's happening in a day? Like, can you see there's just this like, you know? And over the entire period, we may do, if we deal with one emotion or two, we will go up in our lovingness. But can you see we've also gone down in it quite frequently in, in much of our decisions and choices that we've made in a day. Right? Now, every one of those decisions and choices could have had a different outcome. Every one of them. Right? So when I get up in the morning and the kids are still lying in bed, I could have made a decision and choice to not yell at them and to work out why it is that they don't want to get out of bed in the mornings. <laughs> There's got to be a reason for that. Trust, trust me, you take the kids on holidays. <laughs> when do they get out of bed then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, daybreak or earlier, right? You know? But when, when you've when you got a school day, when do they get out of bed then? Like, you've got to drag them out. Don't you? It's like, drag out of bed, get dressed sort of thing. So wh- something's going on there that, n- that needs to be addressed permanently. needs to be addressed permanently. And it can be addressed permanently if I have the courage to actually deal with the situation. So there, there came the decision to yell at the child, I could have acted in a more loving condition. Does that make sense? When I made them a meal, I was acting in a loving condition. But maybe I did it out of resentment, then I was being unloving. <laughs> Can you see, every moment I have these choices, and, and literally our life is like choice after choice after choice after choice after choice, and there's all these choices that we're making all through even a single day where we make Love, loving or unloving choices. Now, some of the loving choices are towards other people. Some of them are towards ourselves. Some of, them, some of the unloving choices are towards other people. Some of the unloving choices are towards ourselves. Many of us make unloving choices towards the environment every single day. Right? Many of us make unloving choices towards animals every single day. You know? We're there patting our cat on our lap and eating a steak at the same time. Like, how duplicitous is that one? Can you see the problem? Like, we're, we're killing one to, uh, to eat, and the other one, if anybody killed it, we'd, we'd go into a meltdown, wouldn't we? Like, how many, how many of you would feel really upset if somebody killed your pet? Right? Yeah. But killing another animal is fine. For, for many, right? So, so can you see there's duplicitous decisions going on at every single moment in our lives, yeah? And, and obviously these decisions, we can, every one of them is an opportunity. Every one of them is an opportunity to become more loving. Every single one of them. Every one of them is an opportunity except God's gift that he's giving you these opportunities. So really the gifts, the, the biggest gifts that God gives you are all opportunities, God doesn't go and give you things in terms of generally give you things like, oh, here's, here's a million dollars, this is just for you. But God certainly gives you, in the, in the course of a day, many opportunities to make a million dollars, which the majority of us ignore, do we not? Right? And that's just money. Like, let's look at relationships. 
many opportunities there in our relationships that God gives us. Opportunities to get to know other people, truly get to know them. Opportunities to speak the truth to them. Opportunities to desire them to speak the truth to yourself. Opportunities to really know them at the soul level instead of know the facade. You know, opportunities to, to present your soul to the world rather than a facade. Right? God's giving you all these opportunities every single moment and most of us have a tendency to make choices that are still not harmonious with love, whether it's love of ourselves or love of another. Right? And this is why you can see on earth how difficult it is and why it's so difficult to, get at one, to become at one with God, can't you? Because on earth you've got all these external pressures pulling you back into the earth's condition. Right? In the spirit world, if you, made, if you made a decision of opportunities and opportunities come up and eventually got to a second sphere condition, you would arrive in the second sphere, you'd be welcomed with a, fair, a fairly large song and dance and fanfare, you'll find, and, and so everyone notices you, you've just arrived and, and, and you're now in a newly loving environment, much more loving than you were previously, and you feel that inside of yourself and that just creates more positive feelings and energy inside of you and you have more beautiful emotions passing through you. That helps you focus on the, more, on the other unloving things that are still within you more and you have more dedication and desire to deal with all of those things automatically. But here on earth, we arrive in the second sphere condition, not a single person notices. <laughs> and in fact, the majority of them complain about what we just arrived in. Because, and particularly if we arrive in a third sphere, like in the third sphere, you'll arrive in the third sphere generally when you're willing to tell the truth to every single person you've ever met. And you're willing to tell the truth about your entire life, whether you're ashamed of it or not. And you're willing to tell the truth and live in harmony with the truth all the time. Now you imagine, you arrive in that place, what does your environment on earth feel about that? Yeah, now, now that's not a very nice place from their perspective, is it? Like they don't want to hear any of those things and they certainly don't want to hear the truth from you generally. So can you see on earth it's a lot more difficult to stay dedicated to your relationship with God and your relationship with your soul and stay dedicated to operating in harmony with love than it is in any other environment. But there is one advantage. And that is, if you can do it here on earth, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> right? That's the advantage. And it's the people who demonstrate faith and action on earth that also are the people that progress the most in the spirit world. Right? Because in the spirit world it's much easier to do it once you know what to do. By, d by the way, in the spirit world it's much more difficult to do it if you don't know what to do. So if you learn what to do here on earth emotionally, it's a very, very positive effect in the spirit world. But here we go, we progress into the second sphere on the divine love path and we receive some divine love and not many people around us even know that we've changed. We can feel them more, we can feel their emotions more, but they don't seem to be able to feel ours. In fact, they seem to be able to feel ours less. Right? And it's like, whoa, I'm starting to feel more alone now. Right? And then, and then so, so then we start progressing, we're trying, you know, trying and trying to get to the state where we're living in harmony with truth all the time in our lovingness. And, and how many people around us like that now? Even the ones on the divine love path don't like that very much. Because right? we tell them the truth about what we feel from, oh, no, it's not like that, and just you, you know. And, and, and we get a lot of rejection in that place. Right? Can you see how... The earth is geared to you not accepting the gifts positively. The earth is geared to actually you keeping your current state or make it back to what the earth state is, whatever that state is. Right? But if we can positively accept God's gifts, we'll make the choice to be loving in every moment. And we will also notice when we're being unloving a lot more readily. Right? So when, whenever we notice those emotions, like the unloving-based emotions that are unloving to ourselves, like doubt is a very unloving emotion to yourself. Whenever you notice you have a, a fear-based emotion, right? whenever you notice you have any anger-based emotions, 
And by the way, anger-based emotions, I keep saying this, anything from a mild frustration and annoyance right through to rage, resentment and hatred are anger-based emotions, right? And by the way, hatred is the pinnacle of the anger-based emotions. So if you feel hate towards somebody, there's a lot of stuff underneath that before you'll get to the truth of, of the grief. So doubt, fear, rage, shame... And all those emotions we started, talked a bit about yesterday, they are the emotions that, that we have the choice now to act harmoniously with love about or the choice to stay in them. And we can make the choice. We're allowed to make the choice. God's giving us the opportunities constantly. You'll be surprised in this break, and it would be a good exercise for you to consider, in this break, what you attract and the choices you make that are either loving or unloving. So somebody comes up to you and you go, oh, not this person again. It's like, oh, I'm tired of... Instead of, if you're acting lovingly, you would at least be truthful to your own emotion. You turn to them and you say, look, I find it really difficult talking to you. I don't know why, <laughs> maybe. Now that, you have just been more loving than going, oh no, here we go again. Oh yes, how are you? Da, 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 da. Give me a hug, isn't it nice? That is not loving, right? Because it's not truthful. What you're really feeling is you feel like, oh, I don't know if I want to talk to them. Or, eh, you know, I feel something's going on there. I feel uncomfortable with them. I don't know why. So express that. I feel really uncomfortable. What do you feel with me? <laughs> Do you feel uncomfortable too or what, do you just feel my resistance to you or whatever? What do you feel? Now that space is a lot more loving than the make-out hug thing that we have a tendency sometimes to do that's not very loving at all. And the reason why it's not loving is because it's not real. Does that make sense? Yep. Jen? Yeah. Um, yesterday... I walked up to Mary and um, expressed the difficulty that I've been having with her. Yep. In an honest attempt to confront the emotion within me. Yep. Can you express, but though, I, what you said to Mary? Um, Mary, I'm having, still having difficulty. Mary asked me. No, no, what did you say to Mary? Mary, I'm having difficulty with you and I thought if I came up to you and expressed it out loud to you yeah. that that would help me to, fit, to confront the fear I have. Can, can you see the unlovingness in that action? This is... This is why I wanted to ask you yep. because I walked away from the interaction um, not only having felt the difficulty but also feeling like I'd compounded the unlovingness and... Yeah. Can I explain created, how, how that was the case? Created more of a barrier, but I didn't... This is very hard. But Jen, I want to... F Jen, you don't need to go now into a display of emotion that's not real, okay? So let's just settle with what you've just said for a moment. All right. Now, d you said to Mary, from my recollection, um, you said that you feel afraid of Mary. Is that not correct? Yes, that's what I said. Does a person who's afraid of somebody else project rage at them? I don't know the answer to that. Well, um, if I was afraid of you, what would be my prime reaction with you? What would be the, the, the most often response I would do with you if I was afraid of you? Stay away. I'd either stay away or... What would I do? I would try to please you, wouldn't I? If I was afraid of you all the time. Yes, I guess so. Wouldn't I? It would be very rare for me to get angry with you if I was afraid of you, don't you think? 
Because every time I got angry with you, you'd, you'd project more stuff at me and I'd be even more afraid. Do you follow me? You're struggling to follow me, Jamie. What, what does everyone else feel? Uh, how do you treat people you're afraid of? Do you, get an, do you project at them or do you stay away? Stay away. D if they're around you, what do you try to do? You try to please them, generally. Right? That's what you try to do. Right? If you're, if you're f afraid, that's what you try to do. If you're not afraid, but rather you're quite upset and angry, what do you do? You might get angry with them or try to control them or try to push them around or try, you don't listen to them much and all those kind of things, don't you? That's what you do. You see, a lot of the times what we do is we finish up calling an emotion something that it's not. And Jen, that's what you were doing yesterday. What you were doing yesterday is actually... Um, and this is what I, I think Mary mentioned this situation to me. And I, and I suggested to Mary that she needed to call you on your actual emotion. Your actual emotion is not fear of Mary. Your actual emotion is very different. Your actual emotion frequently is you don't listen to Mary frequently. Right? When you go up to ask her a question, if, my, if myself and Mary are together, you only listen to me and you don't listen to Mary... <coughs> Right? And oftentimes uh, Mary's noticed that you'll even start talking about something totally different when she's interacting with you, not even hearing a single thing she says. Right? Now that's not fear, that's another emotion. So what's the emotion you feel dominantly with your mother? Because that's what you're acting out with Mary. She was angry all the time. Who was? Your mother? Yes. Yeah, I agree she was angry all the time. But what was your dominant emotion with her? Your mum never protected you from your father. Your mum basically offered you as a surrogate wife to your father. That's what she did. So how does that feel? Shocking. But how do you feel about your mother? doing that rage rage yeah and and you feel very angry with your mother for what she's chosen to do but you're very suppressed with this anger because she's a woman and you have a lot of you know feelings that she's a woman so i've got to uh you know feel like we're all you know a sisterhood here you know there's a lot of those kind of emotions and it's the mother taboo emotion that prevents you from fully feeling your anger and then also your grief about how your mother treated you and what your mother chose to do. She chose to watch you get abused by your own father for many years of your life. And she knew it was happening and she chose to do that. And you're going to have quite a lot of emotions about that. And when Mary opens her mouth, there's a feeling of the same feelings that you had with your mother start kicking in you don't want to listen to her you don't you know and all those things and they're just issues with your mother more than with mary so what we often do is somebody triggers us in some way and we get inside of us this bee in our bonnet and the bee in our bonnet is i'm going to tell them i'm going to make them know what is going what I feel so so we go going up to him and say I was really angry with you well it would be probably better to say I am still really angry with you because the the anger is driving the entire addiction to go and say that does that make sense so oftentimes we feel drawn into telling the person what we feel about them right? which often is out of harmony with love we have a choice in that moment to actually sit on what we feel about them and wonder why we feel so unloving towards them. We have that choice too. Why do I feel so unloving towards this person? Why do I feel so angry towards this person? Why do I feel like I've got a problem with this person? And I can sit with that without having to tell the person, can't I? But let's say the person right at that moment comes up to me here we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to express truth now right, through our law of attraction. And we could say, actually, 
I realize, this would be truthful, I realize I'm so out of harmony with love with you. Because actually I feel quite angry all the time when I'm in your company. Right? And I'm realizing that actually there's something in me that causes this. Does that make sense? Most of the time though, you know what we do? We say, every time I come and see you or every time we go to talk, you're, I feel angry with you. And then we go down the track of going one step further and saying, and you do this and you do that and you do this and you do that and this is why I'm angry with you. But it's not why you're angry with them. right? You're angry with them because whatever they're doing triggers something in you that, tri that it, you're not allowing yourself to feel inside of yourself underneath that with regard to grief or sorrow or shame or any of those kind of things. And you're angry with them because you don't want to feel that. That's why you're angry with them. So it's not even a tr truth to go to say to somebody, I'm angry with you and this is the reason why all of these things you do. That's not even being truthful with yourself or with them. So it's not acting in harmony with love. But it is truthful for me to say, wow, I'm really angry. And, and, and if somebody comes to you and who you're angry with, you say, look, look, I'm sorry, but I'm just in a state where I'm really like, upset with you. And I just need to go and feel what this is about. Sorry about that. Or I'm in a state where I feel, I know there's something, let's say it's something you don't know. Well, be honest about that. You know, Just say the honest truth about it. I just don't know what it is between us, but every time I see you come up to me, I just get, I don't know what it is, afraid or like, like something happens within me anyway, and I just want to run away. So, so let me run away and work out why I'm running away, you know, and, and talk to them honestly about that. Be yourself about it. Does that make sense? Just let yourself, that's a choice you can make in that moment. But if the choice you make is to run up to a person and tell them how you really feel about them and in, in reality the desire, the underlying emotional desire is to have them know that you're angry with them, is that love now? But if your underlying emotional desire is to deal with why you're angry with them, now you won't go up to them and say, I'm angry with you and da 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 you go up, When they come up to you, you go, wow, yeah, I can feel my anger with you. and I'm sorry, but I'm out of harmony with love, I know that. I just need to go and work out what this is about. There's something in our interaction that triggers me. There's something that's in our interaction that causes this emotion to come up that I want to suppress, obviously, because otherwise I wouldn't get angry. And you can deal with that separately. Does that make sense? So, so everything is based upon what the feeling is inside of you and not even really the words, is it? So what's my feeling with the person? Is my feeling that I want to tell them that I'm angry with them? Is my feeling that I want to tell them they're a shameful person? Is the feeling that I want to tell them that they just did something wrong? They should have done it better than that. Is my, what's my feeling? Or is my feeling one of love? Like, wow, I just noticed them do something that is out of harmony with love and, and I can feel that inside in me that this is out of harmony love. Now am I in a loving space before I go and address this with them or am I not? Because if I'm not, then why am I going and addressing it with them? I need to first address my own unloving space. In the first century, I, said, uh, I gave an illustration and this illustration was something, goes something like this. Many of us go up to pick out the straw that's in our brother's eye while at the same time we have a rafter in our own. Right. So in other words, we are so sensitive to other people's treatment of ourselves and yet at the same time we have no sensitivity whatsoever about how we're treating another person. D do you see that? And this happens very, very frequently. Right? Quite often I've heard many people come up to me and they talk about their relationships. And, uh, and they ask me, they, they focus me entirely upon the other person almost every, you know, on almost every occasion. They're entirely focused on she did this or he did that or she did this and he did that and she did this and he did that and I'm really upset and this is what's happening. And I go, I go, generally I go, stop, stop, stop for a moment. What about you? Like, what emotion are you feeling in this like, situation and moment? 
what emotions are inside of you do you feel that might be creating these circumstances or situations? And they go, oh, yeah, no, I'm probably angry with men. But, but, uh, but that doesn't matter. It's a little bit, uh, and then off they go back on the, you know, bang, bang, bang about what the partner does. I say, hang, hang, hang on a sec, hang on a sec, can we stop again? Can we go back to, you're angry with men? Uh, yes. Do you, do you see how that might be having an effect on his behaviour? No. The reason why I'm angry with men is because of his behaviour. <laughs> right? No, the reason why you're angry with men is because of your father's behaviour. Right? And his behaviour is more than likely a law, your law of attraction at least, and if not that, then certainly his behaviour might even be a reflection of your anger projections. Do, do you think a man's going to treat you very nicely when he's receiving rage from you constantly? I don't think so. You see, most of the time what we do is we're in our current situation and we're blaming the other person in the situation immediately, not remembering that actually our emotion was in us before we met this person. Aren't we? We're not understanding that our emotion is present before we even met this person. And this emotion must have come from a different source. We'd be far more honest and truthful going and being loving to the source of the pain that we have, than actually project it at the person that we're with. So most of the time what we're doing is we're given these gifts and opportunities. And actually what many of you have already noticed, and it is the truth, that when you decide to get on the divine love path and when you decide to start dealing with your emotions, the opportunities ramp up. Have you noticed that? Yeah, you call, them, you call them law of attraction negative events, right? I call them opportunities. The opportunities ramp up because of your desire. Your soul desires to grow. How can it grow? It has to expand. How does it expand? It has to be pushed and prodded a bit to expand. That's the only way we're going to expand, ever. right? You try, you try you're getting an elastic band and just sitting it on the ground and say, right, expand. You, know, you need two people pulling it or one person pulling it apart before it's going to expand, do you not? And this is what's going to happen to your soul. Your soul is like that. It's like a balloon. <laughs> the only way it's expanding is to have more pumped into it, right? And the only way for that to occur in terms of our progression is for our life to attract more events, more situations where we have the opportunity to be loving or the opportunity to at least see how we're being unloving. That's how our soul expands. But for, for many of us, what we do is it's like the opportunities pass us by, just like passerbys on a street in the middle of a city that we don't speak with. You know, we walk past the opportunities one by one by one. And as we're walking past the opportunities, we, we don't, don't see that that was just an opportunity to grow. And in fact, that little opportunity that we might have thought was all, nothing to us might have actually been a, a kingpin point of our future growth. It might have actually been the crux of half the issues within our soul. Right? And we just passed it by. And then we get another one. And we, then we go, a year later we go, boy, I seem to have a lot of people do that with me. Yeah, a lot of opportunities there. All just went begging. <laughs> they all just went to waste. Does that make sense? Yeah. If we have a mic up the back, we... Many things. Um. Is it a question? There is about three things. I was out last night. Can you hold it closer, oh. the mic? I was out last night and I wanted to buy something and I was immediately just put down and I just felt it and I felt it. I didn't react, I didn't say anything. And through that I went down in myself and so therefore I knew not to act or react. I just gathered my, my feelings up and what I, because this is to do with my mother, what I can, because I n never blamed, well not that I blamed, but I could never see a lot of learnings from mum. I could see them from dad and what I got out of that message last night, how whenever I asked for something from mum, I was never respected 
like the incident last night, mm. I never got it and I was growled at. So there is more things I know that I need to see inside. Now, can I stop you? Yeah. Because what you're doing right now is unloving. Who to? To all of the group. Oh. Can, well, I, I, can I, you see why? No. All right. Let yourself just feel about what, what were you doing? Um. Can you see you're telling a story? Yes. Why do you need to tell a story to the group? For acknowledgement. Okay. So you have a desire for their acknowledgement. Can you see that? Yes. Now, is that an unloving desire or a loving one? If I expect anything from anybody else, is it loving or unloving? Unloving. unloving. Okay. So, so telling the story mm. is actually an unloving desire. Can you see that? It's okay to feel yes. about it. Yeah? Now, let's, is there a question behind the story? Oh, okay. It probably is. No, no, don't try to create one. At the beginning of all of this, was there a question behind the story? Can you see that there wasn't? Can you see there wasn't a question behind the story? I, because I've gone into fear. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> That's burning. okay. My body's burning inside, so I better finish. <laughs> well, no, no, it's all right. Now, you, now you're feeling ashamed. Okay, so just feel the shame. That's okay. Like, it's okay to feel the shame. What I wanted to point out to you is the desire to tell the story is actually imposing your story upon 100 or 200 people. Because I always get everything wrong. Yeah, but, but there's a point to it inside of yourself. Why do you want to tell the story? Probably because the consequences is <clears throat> no matter what I do or say, I get it wrong. Because yeah. it's just happened. That's, see, this is where we often tell ourselves furfies, right? That's not the real reason why you wanted to tell the story. For acknowledgement. That's more appropriate, isn't it? That's the reason why you're going for the story. If you, were one, if you had a question, that would be more loving. Because okay. it might be a question that 10 or 20 other people also have. Does that make sense? Yes. However. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes when I tell my story, it can help other people. No. Actually, it's not when you tell your story that it helps other people. It's if the people have a desire to listen to your story and you tell them the story, then it helps other people. <laughs> can you see the difference? Say that last bit again. Uh, the only time your story is going to help another person is if, when that, if that person actually has a desire to hear it in the first place. And sometimes pennies can just drop for someone. So now you're justifying imposing your story upon others with the potential hope that penny drops for them. Mm. Does that sound loving? <laughs> <laughs> How can you have a loving result from an unloving action? Well, I did not know it wasn't from an unloving I know, but position. can you see even in this interaction there's a tendency to justify the unloving action? And your justification of it is somebody else might benefit from mm. this story. Mm. Yep. Whereas I feel somebody else would benefit more from the question that you would have if you had one. I get that yes. Yep. And your desire to tell the story is a desire to hold, like to have not just me, which is, many of you have the desire for me to hear the story. And I don't know why you want me to hear the story. Or well, if there's something for someone else to learn. Well, don't you feel that I'll be sensitive enough emotionally to feel the rest of the group and know what the group needs to learn? Can you see it's almost like a condescension towards myself? Well, sometimes uh, um, if I hear something told that way and I don't get it, yeah. um, then you'll say something else and yeah. it'll come from another angle and I'll get that one. And so you must feel that I don't, I'm not telling things from the right <laughs> angle and you've got some angles that you want to add. <laughs> and that's okay. But why don't you create your own law of attraction with a group of 200 people to listen to you in under those circumstances? I know. Why don't you do that? I will. You, can, you see, you see, <laughs> 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 you not only will, you just have. <laughs> I better stop. <laughs> <laughs> so
So what, what, I, what I'm trying to get across to you, though, is that often we have a desire for other people to listen to us that is stronger than our recognition of whether they want to listen to us or not. And this is why many times in interactions with people, you sometimes feel overburdened. You've noticed that in many of your interactions. Somebody comes up to you and they start talking to you and you're feeling like, oh, I just want to get away from this person. This person just feels like they're overbearing and they're, they're, they're wanting something from me. They're, they're giving me something, but really they want something. And what they want is for us to listen to them or approve of their story or whatever. And, and it will be actually under those circumstances, again, another choice, this is a gift God's giving us, it would be unloving for us to listen to them under those circumstances. Does that make sense? Because, and all we need to do is be sensitive to, and feel our emotion. What do we feel? We feel, oh, pressured. We feel overburdened. We feel pushed into a corner, whatever. There's only two reasons why we'd feel that. One is an, uh, an unloving emotion within us, and the other is that the other person's actually doing that to us. <laughs> Isn't it? And if it's the first, then we need to feel our own emotions, and if it's the second, we need to feel our own emotion. We need to feel our own emotion under both circumstances and respond truthfully in both circumstances. And, and so... The, one of the reasons, you've had your hand up uh, three times now, I, I think, before I actually asked you the question. And do you know why it took me th that amount of time to actually ask oh, you? there'd be a reason. Because I can feel the emotion from you mm. of I wanting mean. everybody to listen to a story. And one of the reasons why you yell out in the group a bit mm. sometimes mm. is the same emotion. Wanting everyone to hear what your opinion is of what's being said. And that's a desire for, I have the same opinion as that. And I want everyone here to know that I have the same opinion. Does that make sense? I have a, yeah. Do I say? You can say whatever you oh, wish because no, you've no, still got the microphone. <laughs> 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 but you've got to bear in mind that I'm going to probably address it. <laughs> well, okay, I'll go on. I have a burning desire inside mm -hmm. and it's, if I don't get it out, it's like a volcano. Yes, but, and this is something to, for many of us to bear in mind, many of our burning desires are quite self-absorbed and are not very responsible in terms of what's going on around us for many of us. A burning desire that's self-absorbed is not actually a burning desire, it's an addiction. And many of our addictions are driven by terror-based emotions. In other words, we can't but help ourselves do it, mm. right? And when you can't but help yourself do something, don't always assume that it's a passion it can often be an addiction. Because you think about it, how many people can't but help themselves have a smoke or can't but help themselves have a drink when there's one available and can't but help themselves do anything? It's all because of these big emotions that are addictions inside of us many times. Now, the reason why I avoided asking you when you put your hand up like that, <laughs> right, up the back, you're already standing and I can see... <laughs> Right? And the reason why you're putting your hand up is because you do want this interaction, right? Mm. And you're standing up like that, putting your hand up and, go, and going like that. And then, and then I'm starting to talking and quite often I'm actually saying some things <laughs> that I need to finish. And you know that, but you still got this going up like that, like, like that, about a subject that even wasn't related to the discussion at this point. Because as yet, yeah. there has been no relationship to the discussion. Aside from my interaction with you mm. afterwards. Pardon? Aside from this interaction we're having now, which is related to the discussion. Because I feel that you neglect me, but I know, ah, I know. Spot on. <laughs> spot, I, I do neglect you, totally. Yes, and this is the point. I purposefully oh, neglect you. Smoke. Do you understand? I purposefully mm. neglect you. Mm. And the reason why I purposefully do, because there, it, to, to actually engage you while you're demanding like that would be an unloving act on my behalf. Do you, do you follow me? And, and the only reason why I chose to engage you this time is because it was a part of the lesson that I was teaching that I wanted to get across to everyone else. Do you follow me? But I don't really like doing what I'm doing. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> why? Well, half I do because I need to get it out in the open. Uh, yeah, but Why? Can you see it's all to do with this emotion of being recognised, having what I feel validated by others and so forth? Can you see it's an addiction? Yes. Yeah, that's why. That's why it feels such like it's such a, uh, something that you've mm. got to do. You know? mm. yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And there's another person in the audience doing it right now as well. Thank you. I know. <laughs> Which I shall also ask.
Um, what are some things that you did, AJ, to identify the God's gifts to you? Um, every moment is a gift of God in the end. So, so if you just think of every moment of your life as a gift that's being offered to you where you've got choices to make, you will then notice every single one of them. It's, it's like um, if, you, if you don't view every moment as a gift and if you view every moment as a chore, then you'll neglect lots of gifts, as, as a pro, you know, lots of possibilities. Life is like this continuous stream of possibilities being offered over and over and over and over again, right? And this is the beauty of your life, is that you can choose to do whatever you want in these uh, possibilities and options that you've been offered. But the majority of us, what we do, is we neglect every moment as a possibility of an action that's loving. So, so all, I've, all I made a choice to do right back in my first century life was to use every opportunity as a moment to express love and forgiveness. And when you do that, you notice all the opportunities automatically that come along, opportunities to engage and so forth with others. Yeah. And it's wonderful for yourself as well as for them, every single time. If you, you think about it, if you're acting in harmony with love and truth every single time that you can, what will happen is in every single one of those interactions, both you and the other persons are always going to benefit from the interaction. That makes sense, doesn't it? And if you choose... To, off, to act in harmony with fear or doubt or any of those other types of emotions, which are all the unloving emotions, if you like, and you choose to make the choices along those lines, then of course the interaction is going to not benefit the both of you so much. Because love always benefits people more than any other thing that you can do. So it's just a matter of notic noticing that your entire life, second by second, is opportunity after opportunity. And once you notice that, it's an opportunity to love both yourself and everyone around you. Then you'll start seeing the opportunities just flowing into your life. At, at the moment, they are flowing into your life, but being often pushed aside, neglected. So what I've noticed many, has happened to, for many is that sometimes a suggestion is made to you by another person. And I'm going, wow, if they could realise, if they actually took that suggestion and ran with that suggestion right what would actually happen was their life would change quite remarkably and yet i notice in the other person who's the receiver of the suggestion they're going oh i don't like this person making this suggestion to me oh, you know i feel a bit upset with him about that you know oh, like i feel really uncomfortable with this like he's trying to force me to do what he wants to do really and, and you know i can see all of these things going over in their mind and their feelings c coming up as well and in that moment they're not seeing the wide variety of opportunities that is behind this little door. So every one of these opportunities are like a, a doorway into, into a wonderland. You know? Can you remember the Alice in Wonderland story? Yeah, Walt Disney is quite clever. Hey? Very spirit influenced. But uh, he, he actually, he, he did, he was very spirit influenced in a positive way. And what he did was he, he took a lot of... Um, what 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 are natural love lessons i suppose you could say of the universe and he condensed them down into cartoons right and and a lot of the stories that were created as a result that he presented were just like filled with spirit influence choices decisions you know what about pinocchio you know the story of pinocchio and a lot of these other stories are all like they're all analogies of life that we can learn from if we allow ourselves to. And if you look at the Alice in Wonderland story, she had to go through a little door, remember that? She had to take a potion and shrink down to a little door. So she opened this little door and then she went into this wonderland, right? Well, these little doors are there constantly in our lives, right? They're constantly being given to us, shown to us and all these kind of things. And what we do is we walk past them because they're so small. We think they don't open into a wonderland. And, and they do. They do open into a wonderland in most cases. And, and, and if we're in a place of love and truth, they can open into these remarkable places. And so um, the same goes with the story of Pinocchio when you think about it. It's another story about choices, isn't it, really? Can you see that? Like every time he told a lie and he had a choice to tell the truth, you know, that must have been a lot of problem in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
and it just grows a bit longer, right? And then, and then longer and longer and longer and longer, right? And every time he compounded it, you, can, you see, can you remember the story? He compounds lie upon lie with the subsequent result in himself. And that was an analogy of actually as you do the same thing inside of your own life, your physical form distorts every single time this happens. To be frank, if all of us could look in the mirror and see our spirit body rather than our material one and, and just notice an action we just took and then look in the mirror, we would actually see the relationship between our physical appearance in the spirit form to every unloving action we took. That would be remarkable, wouldn't it, to do that? You all have the ability to do that, actually, believe it or not. We all have the ability to actually see our spirit form in a mirror if we are open to it. The truth is that majorities are not open to it because we'd be too afraid to see what we see. <laughs> and so we don't want to see. And, and instead of seeing what's really going on in our life, what we finish up doing is ignoring most of that and not seeing the results of our unlovingness. That's what we finish up doing. The end, yes? Um, I was just going to ask AJ, is it the same with our physical form? Because quite often uh, after people have released a big emotion, you can s I can, you can see the change in them. They look different. I don't know how, but I can just feel it's different. Of course, yeah. It's a bit less noticeable though, obviously, and, and far less rapid. Uh, our cell structure has time that it has to do to replicate itself, to actually reflect the changes. So while we may see the crease lines in a person after a big release disappear and they seem clearer and all those kind of feeling, things that we see, the truth is actually what's happened is their spirit body is instantly clearer, but the physical form takes quite a number of days in order to actually demonstrate the clarity that of, you know, that results from the emotion just being released. It may even take a few months. In some locations of our body can take up to seven years to actually release. Does that and make sense? We Until we're at one with God, that is. And then we end up around 25? Of course. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be 25? Some of you might want to be younger, I don't know. <laughs> um, but 25 is good, huh? 25 to 30 feels pretty good. Um, so yeah, yeah, of course. And as we go through the different emotions that we're releasing then our spirit body instantly reflects the changes in, our, in, in that. So, so the beauty of spirits looking at what you're doing is they can see what's happening very rapidly. So many of you who have mediumship abilities have noticed that, that more and more spirits are coming to you to talk with you. And the reason why that is the case is because they see the rapid changes happening in your spirit form that you don't see. And they want to talk to you about how is that happening to you and it's not <coughs> happening to me. That's what they want to talk with you about most of the time. And, and rather than just tell them to go to the light, you'd be far better off having a bit of a chat with them firstly about what process is of the emotional release and the process on the soul and how that affects the body. And then tell them to go to the light if you want. But they've come to you to have those answers. Um, so, but, it, but certainly your s physical form will actually improve markedly as you release more and more emotions. As I've said to you before, your physical body has the, has the potential to completely replicate itself every seven years without any degradation. But the so-called death gene, which is actually more to do with our soul than being a genetic problem, um, it actually causes our body to degrade. The reason why is our emotional system is not released enough for our body to not degrade. Once our emotional system is completely released and you'll be at one with God, you then can mirror your soul's condition through your physical form. Yeah? So my physical form still got a lot of improvements to make. Yeah? And, uh, and I can feel the pains and what particular locations they are and what emotions they are relating to in many cases. And you can do too. And so it's just a matter of allowing ourselves to work through those emotions till we get to the place where now there are no deformities in our soul that are out of, nothing out of harmony with love. And once nothing is out of harmony with love, the so-called death gene in our body will also disappear. Okay? Which means we don't either have to, our body doesn't have to degrade over 70 years our body can survive hundreds, if not thousands of years, if that's what we wish it to do. Right? Now, many of you won't wish to do that. 
because there are literally experiences in the spirit world that you'll want to experience that you can't experience as well while you may remain physically attached to your body. So over, you might decide, oh, I'll stay here a couple of hundred years. You know, maybe have children when I'm about 30 or 40, and then wait another 40 or 50 years, have another couple of kids. <laughs> um, wait another 40 or 50 years, maybe have another couple of kids. And then, uh, and then you know, do a bit of uh, interspace travel or whatever else in my spirit form so I can see what's out there. And, uh, and, and do a bit of like, you know, stuff about all of the different things you'd like to investigate in the physical, in the physical realm. And then you say, ah, oh, getting a bit bored with this now, I think. And I might want to do some other things. And your body, once you make that choice, will make the natural changes for you to transition or to pass. And when you pass, you'll come back in a physical form anyway, right? So, because you, cause you can by then, by then most of us will be able to just come back into this earth environment because the earth environment hopefully by then might be even in a six-sphere condition, you don't know. And if that's the case, you'll be able to materialise your form, walk around here, with, talk to any of the friends that you've got still sitting on earth for some reason. And then, and then, you, uh, <laughs> and then you go back to where you're doing things and you can actually have thousands of those interactions at once, once you progress up to that soul union condition. So there are just like, the possibilities are endless, but every one of these possibilities is dependent upon the gifts that have been offered to you right now. You see, the gift offered to you right now, one of the primary gifts offered to you right now, is the gift of knowing yourself in your real condition right now. And until you know that and willing to accept that, how will you ever be willing to change? Uh, until you actually can love where you are right now, no matter how bad it is, how can you be willing to change into this new place? And then accept the other gifts that God gives you and you act in a loving way and in a truthful way and then your condition improves and your condition improves and you deal with some more emotions, which is acting in a loving way towards yourself, by the way. Dealing with your emotions is loving to you. And so you deal with that and that's more loving to you and then you uh, act more lovingly to others and you're constantly progressing then with every choice but, but if in a day in the course of a day you make a lot of negative choices out of harmony with love then can you see you're sort of undoing the work you've done can you see that and, you, and this is what happens like this is what I said about that, that time scale you know this is what happens with our lovingness is that we have a tendency to go up a bit and down a bit and up a bit down a bit 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 but in the end What's the overall progress? Often it doesn't feel very much because we don't realise how many unloving decisions we made in a day. And we're not coming to terms with that inside of ourselves. We're not noticing ourselves. We're not noticing how unloving we're being. Right? And instead, if we accepted the God's gifts that are given us in every one of these moments that are a turning point, so there's a turning point there, there's a turning point there. In our day-to-day -day life, there were turning points where we could have reversed the decision. We could have chose at every one of those points. See, that's the point where we went downhill. We could have chose at every one of those points to actually make a different decision, a loving decision rather than an unloving one. Can you see that? And at those points, where would we have gone? So you see, rather than going down, we would actually have gone up further. Can you see that? And if we got to this point, gone up further. And this point, up further. You see, in the course of the day, we could actually be quite a lot more progressed than we were at the end of the day here. Because when you think of it, every negative decision that we make, every one that's not positive, not in harmony with love, but negative, in harmony with fear, anger, rage, doubt, whatever, and w every time we made one of those choices, we degraded our soul condition, we just undone a whole series of work that we've just performed. What's the point in doing that? It's like, can you see why a lot of, for a lot of us it's like up, down, up, down, up, down, and at the end we don't feel like we've progressed very much, and the truth is we haven't. That's why we feel like we haven't sometimes. Uh, wait for the mic. Hey, do you, and, and how do we actually, oh, oh, how do we actually um, know that we're taking the wrong choice. It seems like a silly question, but you know, I I try my best to to do the right choices, 
and but sometimes I can't do them. And yeah. As much as I, I'm trying to be aware of it, um, then I realise, oh, that wasn't the right choice. Can I, I, can, I, can, I though, can I just so can I just stop the stop trying it, though? Yeah. Because because the truth is, if we have to try, then there has to be an emotion. So what I would do at this point here, let's say that proposition comes up, and I feel angry. I feel like I want to act in my anger in this moment, just for a moment, just that first one, right? Mm. What I would do is I'd just stop my action. I would stop my action altogether, and I would actually go out, bash the bag, express my anger that's present. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Scream like so, sometimes I'll, I'll go out the front door and just go, Aah! right, and just let myself feel the, the anger and rage that's there. And then I'll just sit out the front and just let myself, I just blew our sound system up. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, and and what I what, so once I get to that point, I just let myself experience that emotion, right? So that that releases some of this anger, right? And now I can sit down and feel what was this about? What was this about? What was this about? Why was why did that anger and rage just arrive there? So rather than acting in the anger and rage towards the individual's concern, it's far better just go out and express that, and then connect with what. And I, usually I connect with some grief in that moment, and in that moment then. I can now go, okay, now I can walk back into this situation and now deal with this situation in a more loving space. And if I've actually released the causal emotion, I will never have to revisit that angry place again because the angry place won't even appear again. Yeah. Now, the problem you're personally facing, if I can address that, is you are still, as I've mentioned to you when I was in Coffs Harbour, not last time but the time before, you are still not seeing how much denial of emotion you have in play. And that causes you then to not be sensitive to each situation in terms of what's loving and unloving. You see, it's only through our open emotional condition that we can actually feel the difference between love and what's not love quite easily and readily. That's how we feel the difference, by being totally open emotionally. When we close something down emotionally, we stop our own ability to be sensitive to what we are personally doing to others and what they are personally doing to us in any interaction. Does that make sense? And it's yes. that stopping of ourselves where we're, not we're, we're making a big emotional choice of a gift. God's given us this gift of knowledge that our emotions are the key to our soul development and by blocking ourselves emotionally... What we're choosing to do is act unlovingly to ourselves, which has just as much a painful effect as acting unlovingly to somebody else from God's perspective. So my suggestion is allow yourself just to pray about opening more up to the potential of what emotions are actually present rather than, rather than intellectually denying anything that's mentioned to you is present. In our last conversation, I remember... I listed four or five different emotions that were present in you and you told me they weren't. And, and in, the, in that interaction, you had five opportunities offered to you, one after the other, bang, 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 in, to love yourself, and in I every one of them you rejected. Does that make sense? I, I was aware of that. Yeah. And um, I, I think I expressed to that um, I was detuned for a while because and, and I'm not trying to That's justify right. myself. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, what happened. yeah, yeah. And often we do detune because we I are so to overwhelmed. Do that because I had to do practical things from in my life. Ah, well, that's where that I was disagree. My choice. Yeah. yeah, it was my choice to say. Put yeah, my you don't have to. It was your no, choice to. Yeah. Yes. It was my choice to put that aside because I wanted to move to uh, north. So. But can I can I say the so real I because though? The real because is that you weren't willing to love yourself. That's the real reason. The real reason why you chose to put aside your emotions for moving or any other reason is because you weren't prepared to love yourself in that moment. Does well, that make sense? Not at that moment. Um, no, but see, now you're justifying. See, now we're going straight into justification again. I, I, I don't want to justify. No, you do. I have, I've started to... Okay. You do want to justify. I, I've started to open myself up and tune up again. Good on you. When I, when I did all the things that I wanted to do, and y I started yeah. again. 
No, but see, but this is, see, this is a fallacy that a lot of people still have playing inside of themselves. You see, a lot, a lot of you think, oh, I want to do this list of things. So there's one, two, three, four, five things that you might have listed down that you've got to do, that yeah. you tell yourself you've got to do. So what you tell yourself is, I'm going to get all of those things and I'm going to do those things before I feel this emotion of rejection that I have stored in me or before I feel this emotion of being unloved that I have in me or before I feel whatever emotion, right? And so what we do in that moment is we've just made a choice to be unloving to ourselves. Yes. Totally. I agree. No, I know you agree, but you're not seeing the significance in your own soul because you wouldn't be justifying it. See, see, when you get to a point where you love yourself, you will never justify doing something that's out of harmony with an emotion you're feeling at the moment. You will firstly feel the emotion. Then you'll make choices and do things. Right? So the majority of us are still like, so let's say you want to move house, for example. Let's say you want to move house. When you move house, you start listening down all the things you've got to do. Do you not? Yeah. Like, what do you got to do? I oh, disconnect all the services, you know, and then what have we got to do as well? You know, so we write down a whole list of all the things we've got to do. Yeah. And then the next step, you know, the next step we take that is way out of harmony with love. We deny our emotion while we do every one of those things. And in that moment, we are not accepting God's gifts because every one of these things that we've got to do then can become a gift for us to act in harmony with love towards ourselves. And while I justify shutting down myself in order to do those things, I am justifying myself being unloving to myself. That's what I'm doing. Okay. And what I'm saying to you is you can justify that as long as you like and you that is your free will choice. I'm telling you that you're doing it and you don't even want to see that you're doing it. Right? I am but I'm saying that you are doing this and what's happening to your soul because you're being unloving to yourself is you start off the day like that and then every time you had to do that job and stop yourself from feeling that emotion, this is what happened yeah. to your soul condition. Okay. And every time you chose to feel one of these emotions rather than do that job, this is what happened to your soul condition mm. and vice versa and vice versa. Now, if you want to live the rest of your life doing that, that is your choice. But my suggestion is to when you get to this point where you're confronted with the choice of accepting the gift that God's given you or not, make a different choice. Make the choice to always honour the emotion before you do the thing. Hmm. Always. And honour the emotion while you're doing the thing. Even that's even a better place again. While you're doing it, honor the emotion, honor the feeling of the emotion. So, so you get up in front of a group of people and you say, Oh, I've got to suppress my emotions now. No, 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 you don't. No, you don't. You, you can feel all of your emotions when you're in front of a group of people, whether they like it or not. Many of us go to work, we get up and go to work in the mornings and we say, Oh, I've got to shut myself down now for eight hours or nine hours, don't we? No, no, no. See, work is an opportunity here. There's an opportunity to deal with quite a lot of emotions here. So you start dealing with one emotion. You start crying. And your boss comes up, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? What's going on? Like, why are you crying at work? You need to go home. But I don't want to go home. This is a great opportunity <laughs> for me to deal with this emotion while I'm at work. I don't want you dealing with the emotion. Now we're in another emotion. What's the other emotion? Oh, the boss is disagreeing with me and he's, he's now going to maybe sack me and who knows what's going to happen in my life. Now I'm in that emotion, so away I go with that one. By the end of the day, I might have the sack. And I go home. <laughs> can you see how rapidly things can change in your life in that space in comparison <laughs> to a different space? Can you see that? You know, you just lost your job in one day. <laughs> How many years might it normally take you to lose your job <laughs> if you didn't deal with your emotion? <laughs> right? And this is the thing, a lot of times we do need to lose our job and we need to find one that we're passionate about that we don't have to cry at for three hours a day to live in. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? A lot of times what we're doing is we're making these choices because we're out of fear, 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 fear. And we're making these cycles to, and we live in love a bit, but we, then we don't live in love a bit, and then we live in love a bit, and we don't live in love a bit. And, and, and at the end of the day, we feel like, have I really progressed much? Oh, I don't really know, you know. And the reason why we can't feel our own progression most of the time is because we're not allowing it to happen as rapidly as it could. 
Right? The truth is it can happen very rapidly if I fully embrace living in harmony with the truth and living in harmony with love at every moment. That's the gift that God gives us of our life. And this is why you will see in the pageant messages that there are many, many spirits who have taken thousands of years to progress to, this, to the celestial spheres. And then there are many others that have taken only two, three, four, five years to progress. And what, why is there a big difference? Because they decided, the ones who progressed that rapidly, decided to accept every gift. That's the difference. The ones who actually are progressing rapidly are the ones who are deciding to accept the gift and allow the change, to allow the changes in their life to occur and fully embrace them. And so, so if I know and I am dedicated now to feeling my own emotions at every moment, what will actually happen? In one course of one day, I might lose my job. That is a potential occurrence, isn't it? But le which, what's more important to you, your soul or your job? You learnt a big lesson in that day, didn't you? That no matter how, you, how bad your job gets, your soul is going to be more important to you. That's the lesson you learnt. And you lived it. You actually lived in the truth of it. For the, for the first time in your life probably, actually. Uh, imagine what tomorrow might bring, if in one day you can lose a job. <laughs> tomorrow might bring all sorts of things. Right? The next day you might lose the relationship you've been hanging on to for 30 years that's been hurtful, right? And then the next day, you know, these things can happen this rapidly if you stay in your emotions. But I'm also I'm making fun of it, but there's a lot of positive things can happen in the day too. You know, you imagine in one day, because you're open emotionally, you let go of all of your issues about abundance. Imagine that. Do you think you'd be worried from that moment on how you're going to create abundance in your life? Abundance would just start popping in here, there, from all sorts of sources. You see? If in one day you could let go of it, you imagine how rapidly things would change. But the truth is, we don't let go of it because a lot of the times we're just we're in this cycle. We're in this cycle of rejecting gift, rejecting gift, rejecting gift, accepting this one because I like that one, accept me, reject, 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 accept that one because I like that one. And what we finish up doing is we accept this whole series of gifts only that we like and therefore accept and all the ones that we think we don't like for whatever reasons we reject and often it's those ones that have the greatest potential to change our life. That's how it works. So my suggestion to you is, with your relationship with God, start looking at your life. This is just an exercise you can do on a day-to-day basis. Start looking at your life as this experiment rather than something that you're addicted to holding on to. And, and let yourself experiment with noticing the things that are offered to you as opportunities for you to work your way through specific things that are blocking you with your relationship with God. And allow yourself to emotionally address them in the moment. Live in harmony with love and truth in the moment. Right? In that moment, rather than putting it off. So, so if in the moment I feel really sad and I start crying, and the moment it happens to me I'm, I'm a receptionist at, at a fairly big firm and I'm crying at the reception table, then that is okay. That's the moment. And I live in that moment and I allow myself to cry when I'm typing. And somebody comes out, what's wrong with you? I'm just sad. So I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. Yes, I can. Uh, I'm doing it right now. So can't you see? <laughs> 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 I am. I can do this. And, and they say, well, you can't do that at work. And I say, I am. <laughs> do you mean I've got to stop or that I've got to go home? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can stay in the moment and you can start challenging when you do this, start challenging your environment. Because in the end, we need to create environments that allow us to be like this. It was lovely the other day, myself and Mary, we walked into a McDonald's on the way home uh, to get a cuppa. And, uh, and um, there was this lady sitting in the corner. She would have been fairly uh, in her 50s or something, was she? Or 60s. And she was, just, she was just sobbing quietly in the corner. Right? And we walked past that and we just said, that's what the world should be like. like <laughs> just everyone, wherever they want, even if it's in public, they just have a bit of a sob in the corner. You know? And she wasn't disturbing anybody. She wasn't causing any problems. And 
she was just allowed to be there and allowed to do that and that's how it should be should be allowed to do these things and and so I sort of feel like every one of these things are opportunities yesterday I, I missed an opportunity <coughs> myself yesterday I was uh, giving you the talk yesterday and I was talking about a bit about Mary's life and her life after my death and there's uh, some emotions there for me that I need to feel about that and the opportunity yesterday I had the opportunity to just go straight into that emotion and because of my fear of talking about the issue, um, I didn't go into the emotion. So I just missed that opportunity. Now I'm going to have to create another one to do with that emotion. Does that make sense? And this is what we often do. We, we do it all the time and we continue to do it all the time until we're at one with God, obviously. But the more that you can stop doing it, the faster things will progress for you. And that's really the point that we're making. So in your relationship with God, understand that God is this beautiful being who gives you these constant gifts and you have the choice constantly to accept or reject them and my suggestion is take notice of the gifts that you're receiving every moment is one of these gifts take notice of the gifts and stop rejecting them you know it's so hard to progress spiritually why do you want to stop the points where you can progress do you know what I mean? Why not just instead get to that point where you would normally make this decision and make a different choice with that gift? Like, look at that as an opportunity to act differently and in harmony, more in harmony with love and truth. And when you do that, what will happen is in the course of a day, you will feel the difference even in one day in you. You will actually feel in one day that you've made growth. And you won't have to go up uh, to ask uh, AJ, oh, do you think I've grown much in the last three months? <laughs> My question almost in return all this is, you don't know you've grown much in three months. Because if you don't know you've grown much in three months, it's highly possible that you haven't grown very much in three months. Because <laughs> you would notice it otherwise. Does that make sense? And if you're not noticing it, it's because of this occurring. There's gift after gift after gift being offered because God loves you just as God loves me and everyone else here in the room. So you get, we all get the same offers of gifts, all these potential gifts. And one thing that I haven't mentioned to you yet, and that is sometimes there are s special gifts that God offers that never come along again. Now isn't that a bit scary to think about? Because if you forget to, if you reject them, you may never get them again. That's a bit of a scary idea, isn't it? Many of us don't consider that. You see, gifts are by definition unable to be demanded. Do we understand that principle? And if we understand that principle, can we see that if I'm being offered a gift by God, there is the potential that God may decide not to offer that gift in the future, is there not? We don't know. And so therefore, some of these gifts that we may be offered may be offered now and never come again. For example... Five or six years ago, I met quite a lot of different people um, who were already on the divine love path, they said. Now these people were, many of them, the majority of them were overseas. They were overseas, in a lot of them in the US, but some of them in other countries. And I met them, and, uh, and you know, in the course of the discussion, back then I wasn't that open about my identity, and it took a few hours usually for that to come out. And in the course of a discussion, eventually it came out that I'm saying that I was Jesus, right? And in that moment, they made a choice. It's a choice where a lot of people have made since. They, they made a choice to reject everything that I'm saying to them and to personally reject me in that moment. And many of them made a choice not only to do that, but also to to now personally attack me as a vendetta for the rest of their lives because they couldn't accept that what I'm saying to them about my own identity was potentially true. Does that make sense? So they made a choice. They were offered a gift in that moment and they made a choice. And the choice was to now go into a vendetta against another person. It doesn't matter who that person is. Do you think... If you go into a vendetta against another person, you're acting in harmony with love? Of course not. 
And if you're acting out of harmony of love, what's happening to your soul condition? From that moment it is degrading and getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And many of these people that were on the divine love path five or six years ago, their soul condition has now degraded so much that they're in rages with me. They're willing to post all lies and in the window on the internet. They're willing to do all these different things when they had an opportunity to do something different. They could, have, they could have even had the opportunity to just treat me like I was a crazy idiot, couldn't they? And you wouldn't want to go into a vendetta against a crazy idiot, would you? Or if you loved God and you loved the truth and you loved being able to display love to somebody, would you go into a vendetta against anybody for any reason? Ever? Of course you wouldn't. Right? So in that moment, they made a choice. And you know... The choice of having a personal chat with Jesus right, may never come to them again. Now I'm not saying I'm anybody important because I feel the same about you. My choice to engage you personally right, means that I have the gift of you in my life. In other words... I have this opportunity now to know you and talk with you and to engage you personally. I, I have the opportunity to finish up knowing millions and millions and millions of people on a personal level by my own choice. Right? And you do too, have those choices too. There are some choices too that you'll make and you'll regret not making a choice. You'll regret leaving the opportunity. Then I, and I suggest to you that if you notice God's gifts coming to you at any moment and you act upon them in love and truth, you will never have a life of regret. And there are many people in the spirit world and on earth right now who have deep regrets about their life choices. There are many people who met their soulmate when they were 20 and cheated on them and they know that person was their soulmate and they cheated on them or harmed them in some way and now that person doesn't want anything to do with them for the rest of their life and they live the rest of their life out alone, some of them or they re live the rest of their life out in meaningless sexual relationships, some of them just because they didn't make the right choice when they were 20 just because of one choice now, sure, down the track they will meet their soulmate again if they continue to progress but look at all the lost time the lost love, the lost happiness, the lost opportunities. You see, one of the biggest things that happens in the spirit world when you pass is you notice the lost opportunities that you, the opportunities you had that you just threw away because you didn't value them at the time. Right? So my suggestion is to allow yourself to notice these opportunities being offered to you and allow yourself to make the decisions on them as they occur. Don't make unloving decisions on these opportunities because if you do, this opportunity may never be given to you again. Now for many of you, there's this, there's this wonderful opportunity we have right now. We have an opportunity of living in the time of change on this planet. Many of you I know in your sleep state are considering passing before this opportunity comes because you feel it's going to be too hard on you emotionally. Right? But you could make the choice to live in harmony with love and truth and stick around, you know, and actually make the choice to work your way through the emotions so you can stick around and be safe and make the choice to actually be a part of the change that is happening on the planet and will continue to happen as we grow. These are all choices. This opportunity is not going to come again either. Do you think that there's a, if this if this world goes through this change, this earth goes through this change and comes out the other end in a really positive state, in a loving state, like maybe maybe 50 years later it comes out in a positive and loving state, by the time you're ready to reincarnate, are you ever going to incarnate into the world like this? You're not. Can you see that? So this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Where you are right now is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. A gift that God's offering you due to some kind of things going on in your soul. And these gifts are being offered and you have the choice to take this gift and run with it. Or you have the choice to go and then maybe regret the choice. 
You know, we had a, a friend of ours, a friend of Mary's, pass recently, and we know she made the choice to do so. And and she made the choice because she said once she sees earth changes coming and that they're close, she's going to pass. And she made that choice. She got sick and died. And and many of us make these choices unknowingly, you know, like but but really deep down there is knowledge of most of the choices that we make. So that's why I wanted to discuss that with you and this uh, su subject of receiving God's gifts because there's a lot of very great opportunities that every one of you are receiving every day, opportunities to change this planet, eh? And opportunities to change yourself, opportunities to grow towards God and, and moment by moment there's these opportunities happening and, and a lot of times we just like, oh, oh there, there's another one we passed, there's another one we passed, you know, it's like we're almost living in a day sometimes and not noticing them go past us. And, and a lot of them, we let them go past because we are unwilling to face the emotion of self-reliance. We, we want nobody else to tell us anything. We want nobody else to tell us what to do. We don't want anybody else to tell us what to think. We don't want anybody else to tell us the potential ideas of what they have. And as a result of that, we reject huge opportunities. So I'd like to encourage you to stop rejecting the opportunities and positively and passionately accept the gifts that God gives you. Thank you.